So welcome, Robert. Thank you. Yeah. I would like just to uh, start with one very basic question, and that's a general question regarding writing, writing books. Tell me one thing, how long do you spend researching, preparing, before you actually start writing a story? Well, um, um, it depends on the story. Um, but usually I ha already have the idea in my head and the information before I start it. Mm -hmm. So um, the research is an ongoing process throughout the book. And uh, you sometimes don't realize what you don't know. Um, when I was writing the book about Verona in Italy in 1938, uh, the book, I wasn't writing it in 1938, the book takes place in 1938. I didn't know anything about what people wore. So I had to do a lot of research while I was writing the book on fashions in Italy in, in 1938 and, and the songs that people were listening to and things like that. But I didn't foresee that. It just happened as I was writing it. I realized I needed to put some realistic information in. And Not one thing, we are talking about your book because it was you. You, yeah. That's the one. I just want to show to everybody, so those who did not see the book, and that's the one. Yeah. That take places in Verona. Yeah. And it's one of the cities that has a special place and meaning for you, isn't it? Well, it is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I lived there uh, for a long time and yes it was based on um, I wouldn't say truth uh, none of these stories are but I took what happened there uh, and just turned it into a book but um, it is fiction mm -hmm. and one thing that strikes me uh, in your books I have read some of your books not just one is yeah. that you always use the change of cultural environment, cultural scenery. And in that change, your characters find another personality, another path, a new vision. How much from your personal experience living in different countries, you live in Italy, in Jordan, Portugal, now in Germany. How much of that collective experience adapting, living and in another country, being there, how much of that you do put into perspective in your books through your characters? Well, <clears throat> that is, is a very interesting question. I suppose I've done it but it wasn't intentional. But um, so I can't really say why I've done it, but I suppose it was a natural process. Yeah, all the, uh, some of the books take place in Germany, some in Italy, um, and one of them is in the Middle East. And yes, of course, I use my own experiences. Um, yeah, but it, it, none of them are me, but <laughs> the other people in, in the books. <laughs> But yes, of course, I've used my own experiences of, of uh, changing um, sort of cultural environment. Yeah, I feel like the cultural environment plays, plays an important role in your books. It's always a moment of transformation for the characters when they change from one setting to another. It's not only about the scenery, but it's the cultural feeling that it gives a different uh, boost in it, a different uh, direction the, in those characters' path. Well, yes, I, I suppose that does reflect my own life, but it wasn't intentional. So that's quite, it's quite an interesting point that you've raised. I've never really thought about it, and that's the truth. Mm -hmm. But I suppose, yes, all the main characters <laughs> go through great changes through having lived abroad. In yeah, but one, it wasn't intent. It wasn't an. In, it wasn't my intention to do that. It's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, comment you make. Uh, I'm going to have to think about that one much more because <laughs> I don't um, see any of these. These characters are not me. That's for sure. I don't write about me. 
Uh -huh. Although um, I would say that only I perhaps could have written the stories, but they're not about me. Uh -huh. But now, obviously, you've just made that comment, and perhaps they're more about me than I thought. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the point of uh, change and uh, not really personal, uh, reflecting, as you said, not that you have that in mind, but the no. fact. Uh, the idea and the theme of cultural change has a special place in your romances and in your novels. I, that's what I yeah, found well, as a reader then. Well, I would, I mean, if I'm, yes, yeah, sometimes um, people ask me why you're not living in the UK. Uh, and I suppose when you go and live abroad, you uh, are confronted by a set of different cultural norms. And then you start to question your own. Mm -hmm. And I'd been living in Italy for about, uh, in total, about 12 years. And I went back to the UK um, to work, to live and work. And I stayed there for a, a good number of years up in Manchester. And I found it very difficult at first. I'd become more Italian than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I found the English <laughs> rather strange, to be quite honest. But then I got used to it in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so, yes, I'm not surprised that is one of the aspects of my books. But as I said, it was unintentional. I never intended to write about myself in, in that way. Mm -hmm. And talking about your writing, one curiosity also, how challenging and how difficult it is to write a character of the opposite sex. Oh, very difficult. I um I was asked I was discussing that with a friend of mine recently actually mm -hmm. to be honest we were out on a walk in the hills and I brought up that very topic how easy is it for a man to write about a convincing woman or to make the woman <laughs> convincing yeah it, it's not easy yeah that's for sure and I'm not sure that I've succeeded either <laughs> <laughs> well, I find quite convincing in your book, the one that I just finished, the scenes from Endless Summers. Yeah. Because the female okay. character, she plays one central role. So everything I would say, it's surround her character, this character in the book. Yes, it's mainly seen through her perspective. Yeah. That, that story. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, that's, again, that's a very difficult question to answer. I don't know how I, if I succeeded or not in writing about a woman successfully, but I won't be the first person to ask himself if he's done it well. I can be sure of that. But I leave that to you for you to judge. I, I can't say. Yeah, and other female readers perhaps also. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> Again, back to the scenes uh, from uh, Endless Summers, the same book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another question about that is, I notice that one main point that comes only at the very end of the book, clear to the readers, it's the often uh, mentioned to a children's TV program, uh, character, the flower pot man. Yeah. And that comes as a surprise that made me look back and said, oh, I missed that hint early in the story. And based on that, I'm curious to ask you, what is your favorite childhood book? <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about one book, but I, I read every single book about William, William Brown uh -huh. by Richmond Crompton, the William series, every one. There are about 33 of them <laughs> when I was around 12, 12, 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So Any not best... that early. The Bill and Ben, the Flowerpot Men came a bit earlier. Yeah. Did you watch that program? I did. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I think it was a beloved for an entire generation in England. In the 1950s and early 60s, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 
in terms of books and other authors, have you ever changed your mind about a book, about an author that in the beginning you didn't really find uh, meaningful to you, but after a while, uh, with the time, you sort of appreciate and understand and uh, find it from different perspectives, from different eyes that made you change your mind? Is that an author, a book like that? No, I don't think so. No, no, but no, I, that's certainly not the case. No, I think if I didn't like an author, I probably still don't like them. <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> are you not asking which one you don't like? But there are very few, actually. I mean, there, there's one somebody called um, Jonathan Franson who I whose style I I I didn't like. I tried to read it, so I didn't finish the book. But he's a very successful and very well-known author, but I just didn't take to it. Mm -hmm. And what is most admired author, your most admired author? Um, I think Robert Graves. Mm -hmm. I love his, uh, his novel, his novels and uh, his poetry. Are you currently writing another book? Yes, I am. Yeah, I just started about a week ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so you are not going to give some hints yet. Well, it's going to be a novella. Uh -huh. And the basic theme of the book is about how people are often described by their parents and other relatives, when they are children, the, the people are children, they're often described in terms of, oh, he's selfish, or he's never going to grow up to be anything, or he doesn't like women, or that, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how these things can stick, and they never really go away, even though they may, might be completely untrue. One other question. How do you select the name of your characters? Do you have a criteria? Do you set that in advance based on your research? How do you choose the name of the character? It always comes to me. I, I start off sometimes just calling people John or Jim or Mary and as the story goes on then the name comes to fit the characters. That's definitely the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, as, 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 the, as the characters develop then the name develops alongside it. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, and the same goes for the title. Have you ever changed the name? After you finish the book, go back and say, no, I don't think this that's the name that fits the character. Not at the end, maybe halfway through, yes. But generally, no. Well, once I've decided, the name gives sometimes a very good idea. It, it suggests quite a lot about the character. Yeah. And so, sometimes I have to develop that character first before I give it or give him or her a name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Have you edited out uh, things from your Vrancet books, for example, from uh, Because It Was You or Lights Over Bellano or Scenes from Endless Summer? Have you edited out uh, many things? Edited, yes, a huge amount, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to write in the way that I speak, so those who know me will tell you that I talk too much, and I tend to <laughs> write too much as well. And uh, <laughs> um, yes, I edit a lot. In fact, the, 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 the final product is often not completely different, but very, very different from the first uh, draft. Yeah. yeah for your book uh, lights uh, from Belano yeah yeah over Belano it's quite different from the other two actually the three books I have a specific uh, uh, topics that are different I would say one is a more uh, romance you know innocent the other it's a more sort of mystery thriller 
with a murder. And the other one, it's also a mystery because uh, the characters are not really clear until the very end of the book. And I would not call that um, romance, but uh, mystery fantasy. That Which run that lights over Bellano. Yeah. Yeah, what was your inspiration to write Lights Over Bellano? How come out that idea of a mystery thriller with a crime, which is different from the other one, from the other books? Um, that idea for that book came from uh, something that really happened in Verona just before I left in 1989. There was a village up the road where um, a, a young man killed his uh, parents in order to get his inheritance mm -hmm. and he was put in prison and then released and he's now going the rounds of the television programs being interviewed on Italian TV and I saw that happening but it was that that was the I the idea came from him and it also the idea came from the three years I spent in Treviso which is just north of Venice Mm -hmm. um, a city which was badly bombed during the Second World War by the uh, Royal Air Force I think uh, and how that um, affected people's reactions to foreigners, especially British people like me, <laughs> uh, in the 1970s when I was there. So it's it's a, a lot of a lot of that the, the, the theme of that book comes from things that happened in the past and how they affect people now still, even mm -hmm. though you might not see it immediately. The effect of history, basically. Have you ever considered writing a sequel? A sequel. Lights over of... Bellano, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a sequel in the series of uh, novels based on that one, for example. Yeah, uh, but I'm not sure I'll get around to it. There, there's so much more I want to write about. And um, also, <clears throat> I would say my style has changed as well. And that I'm not sure that the style I'm using now would fit the old style, hmm. but it's uh, something I can think about, yeah. Mm -hmm. And for this new project that you're working on, uh, you still have some research to do, or you already have pretty much the story uh, ready and thought? Again, the, the, the aspects of research, I, it's difficult to foresee them, but I already found myself now I'm looking up uh, how people uh, can be affected by early childhood experiences. So I had to read quite a lot about that, but I didn't foresee that. It just has happened as I started writing it. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm, I've, I've had to start doing research already. Yeah. And also about places. It's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because we always hear that the process, the writing process, it can be quite different from one person to another. Mm. And that goes also in the time that they put into research until the actual writing of the book. Yeah, I can understand that. But, but for me, it doesn't work because I don't really, I have an idea where they stories going and I sometimes write the final chapter mm -hmm. as the first thing I do is to write the final chapter but actually getting there <clears throat> might be a different route <laughs> from the one the one that I anticipated and then you do have to I find I have to do quite a lot of a lot of research actually and the internet is wonderful and um, how people manage without it 50 years ago I, I can't imagine as a writer, I mean, I can't imagine how people manage to write books without yes. the internet. Yes, yeah, certainly it was a different time and different time to write uh, yeah. with the limited resources in terms of research. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a wonderful tool, the internet. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, we have some questions here okay. and I think we have some time that can you can get those questions ah okay so you said yeah the setting of, uh, and the characters really rang true and what kind of potential do you think that the EFL world that's English as a foreign language teachers world uh -huh. as for novel writers it seems like a really rich seam to mine well yes I fully agree um, having worked in the EFL world, uh, I've, 
I've taken a, a huge amount of my own experiences and twisted them and changed them, of course, um, to, to suit my purposes when writing mm -hmm. fiction. Yeah, so yes, in answer to that question, I think that the EFL world has a, a huge amount to offer, at least it did when I was working in it. It might have changed now, but I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. So EFL stands for English Foreign English Language. Foreign Language Teaching, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting also. Yeah, Lights Over Belano, as you said, perhaps has a more association with the uh, a real event. Yes. Yeah, the bombing of the town, yeah. 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 I, I, I was eating in a restaurant one day in, a, uh, in Treviso and a man walked in and he heard us speaking English, a friend and I, and he just started insulting Winston Churchill and said what uh, well I won't say what he said but it was uh, he was quite insulting really and I so many years he... later this was 1976 so it's mm -hmm. not that it's only what 30 years on mm -hmm. uh, so for him he was probably a young man he was probably there when the town was bombed yeah certainly and 4,000 people died for nothing mm -hmm. so we are but, talking uh, about the yeah lights over Bilano. lights over and the lights over Bellano are the the trucker flares that the bombers send before they send the bombers in themselves because uh, again I, I find that uh, what happened in the past had a great influence on all the characters in the book mm -hmm. changing a little bit to the other book that I finished more recently and if there is somebody and the audience watching the interview who also have read that book, please feel free to ask questions, not only about that one, any other book or any other question you'd like to ask Robert. So from the scenes from Adler's Summers, um, yeah. what I caught, found interesting and caught my attention is that I was following the bridging, always expecting to see when that mystery about the characters would unfold because yeah. it was not clear and it was visibly that something was wrong mm. with both of them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was not that so obvious until the end of the book, the very end. That yeah. would make a very fine uh, uh, story for TV, I think. In the movie, it would play wonderfully. Um, well, it, um, it's nice that you say that, so thank you very much. And it, it's not the first time I've heard that, that people said that the, my novels would make very good films. So um, I feel very happy <laughs> about that. Um, but that particular story, interestingly enough, it started life as a short story, which I wrote about 30 years ago. Oh. And I called it The Two Lovers of Budley Salterton. Uh -huh. And it was uh, about, um, well, I got the idea from a plaque, one of these memorial plaques on a bench along the seafront to uh, two lovers of Budley Salterton. And I thought that was such a wonderful, had a double meaning that I couldn't resist writing a story about it. So I wrote a short story mm -hmm. and that eventually mm -hmm. turned into the novella. Yeah. And that's the one I found quite interesting. It got my attention to the end. I wanted to know what was going to happen. <laughs> then, then I succeeded. So. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> we do have one another question for you. Yeah. If yeah. you can read there, um, I can check Which here. Uh -huh. Richard or John? Yeah, this is Richard Hitchcock. Richard Hitchcock? Yeah. How, how has your time living in Italy and Germany impacted on your understanding of and attitudes towards England and the English? Ooh, have any of the developments in your own books surprised you or do you always know where you're going? Well, no, I don't know where I'm going, Richard. That, <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely true. But I have a vague idea. It depends on the book because sometimes I write the last chapter first. Um, because I know exactly where it's going. And that was true of Because It Was You. It was the love story. I knew exactly where that story was going from start to finish. But it was a novella and slightly shorter. The other novels, um, yes, I know where I'm going, but 
I don't always know how I'm going to get there. <laughs> so um, things change as the book goes on. Yeah, that's there's no question about that. And the final draft is often very was usually always, in fact, very different from the first. Um, but the first part, how has living abroad impacted on my understanding of attitudes towards England and the English? Um, a lot, I would say. But how? I think we better get together over a glass of beer. And discuss <laughs> <that one. And>, uh, <laughs> or you better come and visit us in Germany, I think. <laughs> you do have a next question just next there. You see, I hope you write about your... Uh, my recent experiences in England, particularly Portsmouth, you have a beautiful leading lady. Well, I'm sure she'll be very happy to hear about that one. <laughs> She's my wife, of course. <laughs> uh, and in that story, in a scandalous business model back up to draw on. Well, um, <laughs> I, better, <laughs> I better not comment on that. <laughs> Thanks for the offer, John. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that I'll perhaps think, can be a discussion for your blog. <laughs> Indeed, yes, yeah. Yeah, I want to remind everybody that uh, Robert will be taking further question in his blog, yeah. Thoughts and Words. Yeah. And uh, you can find also the link on the website of the Culture Arts, which is in the invitation for this Zoom session. And you, you can find also further information about uh, other uh, books published by Robert then. I would like to continue, but perhaps we set up another time to go further with our conversation then. I would, I would like, you don't have to ask me again, I would be delighted. <laughs> and I thank you very much, it, was, it has been wonderful. You know, it's all interesting when you can uh, read the book and not everybody has this opportunity to talk directly to the writer and ask questions. It's one of the downsides of writing. You write something and you put it out there, but on um, you, you get very little feedback. I mean, some people say, some people do offer feedback. Generally speaking, you don't. You have to please yourself, really, I find in the end. I suppose if it's good or not, mm -hmm. depends on the sales. Mm -hmm in the end. I'm sure we all enjoyed this conversation and I'd like to ask you now about the other books. Yep. About your other books. Yeah. You have a word to say about yeah. your other books because we talked so much about those three, The Scenes from Endless Summers, Lights Over Bellano and because yeah. it was you. Tell us about your other books also. Okay. Um, well, I'll be dead honest about them. I think the, the best books I've written are the last two or three. I think the first ones, in fact, the, one of them, the Schoenbuch Forest, uh, is, is the, my best seller, and it still sells very well. But I don't like it very much, and I don't think it's very well written. I think it's, um, it's overwritten <laughs> and rather boring, but people seem to like it. And I, I think it's probably the theme, which is uh, Germany in World War II. But when I look at it now, I just think it's overwritten, pompous, and uh, I don't write like that anymore. I've changed my style completely to something which is more me, I think. But it's taken about 20 years to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very happy that the book sells well. But you know, I'm kind of reminded of Conan, Conan Doyle, who didn't really want to write Sherlock Holmes either. And he wanted to write historical novels. But they never really took off. It was Sherlock Holmes that took off. And um, so, yes, it's a strange thing that the books I like least actually probably sell the best. Mm, strange. Yeah, another question for you here. Somebody is writing. What is more important that you like in the book or that potential readers like it? What is more important that you like the book or that potential readers will like it? Okay, that's another a very interesting question because I, I, when you write a book, you can spend anything from a year to three years writing it. And if you don't like the book or the theme or the people, it's not, you're not gonna finish it. At least that's my, I wouldn't finish it. I have to really like what I'm writing about. 
you, you simply can't spend all that time and energy writing something and I could be out, you know, walking or biking or something, but instead I write a book. So I have to really love writing the book, which I do. Um, so what's more important, I suppose in the end, it's, it has to be, I have, I have to like the book. And if the readers like it, that's great too. <laughs> but if they don't, well, okay, but I, I can't spend all that time writing, doing something if I don't like it. I just can't. I, I have to be really passionate about the book, and I am usually. When I'm well, always, I, when I write a book, I feel quite passionate about what I'm writing. And uh, that, at, in the point when I'm writing it, is more important. I don't really, because this goes against the grain, really. I don't really think about my audience too much. I think about pleasing myself. If my, that's my honest opinion. And if, if people like to read it, then that's great. <laughs> And there is another question here. Have you ever started writing about something and then given it up? If so, mm -hmm. for into another book? Did it go into another book? Yes. Um, usually, that's a, that's a good question as well. I, yes, uh, several times I've started a book and then just given up because it wasn't going anywhere or I wasn't enjoying it, probably. Um, <clears throat> but the writing itself... If it was good enough or if I liked it, yes, it would find its way into another book. I have a book, the first book I ever wrote, it was called The Melting Snows of Spring. Great title. And that took place in Italy. But I've never tried to publish it um, because it's it's just too dense, frankly. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, uh, but I have used bits of it um, in other stories. So that's in the uh, to answer that question. Yeah. But I finished the book. In fact, I finished it tried to get it published, didn't work, um, and so I just put it away somewhere. But I've used a lot of it, actually, in um, in other books. Well, that's uh, a word that I can give you from the perspective of a musician. Beethoven, for example, he had his notebook. He always put it down, wrote down some melodies, some ideas he had, and later he would take that into his symphony, into yeah. other works. And sometimes he would rework some of his music that had been already published into new ones and made that into new ones. I so understand is, that. It goes on in music, this kind of process also. Yeah, I understand that because here, I don't know if you can see it, I can hold it up here. This is a, a beautiful leather bound notebook, which I buy them for ben, from Venice. And I write in them with an HP pencil. And I love writing in these books. And I've got about 12 of them uh, in, on my bookshelf. And I go through them occasionally to um, get ideas because I've written down all the ideas that I've had probably for the last 20 years or so, more, 25 years. So yes, I, I suppose I do the same. And I can be sure, and I don't want to compare myself to Beethoven, but I'm pretty sure, like me, Beethoven was never happy with what he produced. Oh yeah, that's that's true. Not, uh, <laughs> From the accounts, that's what it's known. Yeah. You go on and on and on, and at some point you just have to stop. Hmm. There is another question for you here. Do novels serve a social purpose? That's an interesting one. Uh, oh, um, they can do. Yeah, yeah, yes. And that is the following one. How do you write? Do you think the paragraph through in your mind? Or do you write with a pen and paper? Very I think good. a little bit you answer already. Yeah, I have. Um, or computer. I, I tend to write straight onto the computer now, but that's something which has developed over the years. I do have these wonderful notebooks, which I can show you again. Um, and I use them for scribbling notes in, uh, and I love writing with a pencil. Um, do I read it aloud? Sometimes when I'm checking the grammar and punctuation, yeah, it's very important actually, yeah. So yes, I do read it aloud. Then you, you pick things up that you can't if, you, if you're not reading aloud. So that comes another question. In your blog, you mentioned that you are inspired by history places. 
memories, yeah. music. What about dreams? Have well, any enough, of your... Yeah, <laughs> yes. I'm, um, do, I'm a yes, little bit slow with the reading. Sorry, it's because of my eyeglasses. <laughs> it okay. doesn't work well in the evening. Um, dreams don't normally inspire me. I think dreams, um, not normally, no. But the my latest book starts with a dream, or rather the character's reaction to a dream. I don't describe the dream itself. I think that's not something I'd be very good at. Um, have they been inspired by... Yes, my characters have been inspired by dreams. Yes, they have. Um, Actually, no, if I rethink about it, no, is the question. Dreams are not that important to me, I would say. Apart from this one at the beginning of the new book, because it does start the main character thinking about his life. Do I do I use a thesaurus? Oh, gosh, yes. I couldn't live without it. <laughs> yeah, that was the next one. <laughs> I couldn't live without a thesaurus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was your question. That's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, the, regarding the question, if books have a social person, novels, stories, what is your opinion about the importance, the impact of this uh, lockdown and pandemic on people's habit of reading, of getting more time to sit down to digest some kind of reading. How do you think that has impacted people's life? Well, I haven't, I haven't seen any statistics about it, but I wouldn't be surprised if people are reading more. And I've certainly noticed that my books have sold a lot better during the COVID-19, actually a lot better. Yeah. That and the fact that I had more uh, covers done, more better covers done. So that, um, yes, they started selling very well around about April, Early this year, yeah. so I'm hope I suppose that's because people were at home. You know, I, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, many people say that the more than ever, artists and writing and culture are the only way out. That people are indoors, but this is the only way that people can escape just one small room. That's the the mind can fly free. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I've, I've just read a book uh, by a Turkish writer called Orhan Pamuk. Um, it's uh, it's called The Museum of Innocence. Uh, have you read it? No, he, no. It's, uh, it's, he, well, he was a, he's a Nobel Prize winner, but that, that book just took me to Istanbul every evening when I read it. And uh, it's the most fantastic book. It's one of the best books I've read, certainly of this decade. Mm -hmm. uh, because it took me out of it took me out of Germany, it took me out of my house, and it just put me right in the middle of Istanbul. That's <laughs> wonderful. It's, it's about eight hundred pages long, but it's well worth a read. It's absolutely superb. Yeah, that would be good to recommend the, the in the blog also. Yes, it's absolutely yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. Somebody wrote it's a beautiful book, well worth reading. So somebody one, did the, read that also. The, the Orhan Pamuk book, I, I suppose you mean, yes, it is. I yeah, maybe we is. could put that in the book club as a suggestion, a reading suggestion for a further discussion. It, and that it also, I mean, the, the title, I was attracted to that book for the, because of the title, The Museum of Innocence. How, yeah, it's you know, interesting, yeah. <laughs> How could you resist a book with a title like that? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so their titles are very important. And I do give a lot of thought to titles. But uh, yes, it, this is a beautiful book, well worth reading. But as I said, I picked it up because of the title. How could I possibly... <laughs> yes, how important is a book's title? Um, how could you possibly not want to read a book like that? You have exactly. another question, how important it's a book style. So. Yeah, well, yes, that's very, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you just described, the Museum of Innocence. Yeah, yeah. it's really an open door to imagination. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another one, do you read more fiction or non-fiction? Now, well, both is the answer. I, um, I read a lot of fiction, 
but I also occasionally like to read nonfiction. But when I'm re when I'm writing, I stop reading because you get influenced by the style of the person you're reading, uh, and I find uh -huh. that very. I'm trying to develop my own voice in a in a book, so reading another book. Um, I find very distracting, so I can't do that. So I've just started. I finished Orhan Pamuk's book, and then I started writing his book, my own book. I can't do both. Mm -hmm. Do any of your books suggest a musical theme or themes to accompany them? Is there a music associated with the book? Yeah, that's a good question. Not quite sure what the question means, but I do. Ah, hmm, that's okay. Um, yeah, but you've got to be very careful about copyright. Yeah, nowadays. <laughs> you only. Really have, yeah, I mean, the, the, I wrote a book. That's the second one I wrote. Is the poor singer of an empty day. It was originally called No Way to Say Goodbye. And I wanted to keep that title, but of course, Leonard Cohen already took that title. Oh, so I, I see. Can... <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not possible. <laughs> no, that was out of the question. <laughs> and there is another question. The Faculty of Useless Knowledge, Yuri Domborovsky, great title, great novel. Haven't read it. That we put uh, it on our list for the book club also. Lights uh, over the Lano, the musical. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Richard, I'm not sure about that, but um, yeah, <laughs> that would be great. And I would love to be the director. But I remember that on scenes from in last summer, you do call some songs, some passages of songs. Well, music, it's an integral part in certain point in that book. Yes, but I changed the words. I, I change the words to the songs. You, you have to, otherwise uh, Sony Music or whoever will come along and slap a fine on you. Really? There's this? It's like that? Very much so, uh -huh. yeah. But you can do without problem with traditional and popular songs that uh, don't have if copyright, out, no? If they're out of copyright, yeah. I think, but I think copyright lasts for something 70 years or something, but so... Um, Anything from the 1960s, early 60s is not really, uh, you have to be careful. Yeah, very careful. Another question regarding Lights of Bellano there. Does the story conjure up a specific musical theme? Lights over Bellano? A musical theme? Mm, I don't know. I can't answer that. I have to be honest. Yeah, that talking about, it says yeah. that no, any story. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think my stories conjure up a specific musical theme, no. And you have another question, say, one of your best books is The Poor Singer of an Empty Day. Can you say something about the background of that book? Because it's such a long time since I wrote it. <laughs> um, oh, people were taking notes. So. Yeah, like that, 20 years. Um, but that one is also about um, coming back to England after a long time living abroad, in this case, Italy. I started this book when I was in Germany. So it was about 1998, I think I started writing it. And I was interested in, in that question, actually, of how, how does living abroad change you? And that's where it started. And then I started to think about um, my own experiences of things that I'd done in, in the 1960s and uh, memory. And memory is a great theme for any, <laughs> any novel. But I started to get this whole idea of do we really remember things as they were? Or are, are your memories made up of false memories? fabrications, books you've read, films that you've seen, you put all these things together and you think you're remembering something, but actually it never happened. And that's basically where I got the idea from the poor singer of an empty day. 
Yeah. Yeah, that, that was... one is also published available on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's one of my favourite stories. And somebody's written know any story, uh, a musical three. What's what's that? Know any story? Um, conjuring up a specific musical theme. That's the last question. Ah, yeah, yeah. No, is... John. <laughs> How does living abroad change you? Um, I suppose. I can't answer for anybody else, but I think the way it's changed me is that mm -hmm. I've changed my values quite a lot. The things which I never even considered, uh, I've taken on as my own, and some of my old English values, I've probably dropped them. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And I remember, I, um, we're going back to work in England, and all of my friends that I made, after this was after living in Italy, all of my friends, that became were either foreigners or English people who lived abroad because they have also experienced the same thing, I think. That you come back and you're a changed person, but you mm -hmm. don't realize it. Well, it but may be when you it, come it, back, things also change yeah. it a little bit. You've changed, but um, you you find that you gather around other people who've also lived abroad at least that was my experience and that it was definitely my experience that I all the friends that I made were people who've lived abroad mm -hmm. and I found the English a little bit sort of narrow actually <laughs> to be quite honest I might say so <clears throat> sorry that's Jan. a correction there for the question the person is saying no no the question ah. the particular music might, might accompany yes. your stories Definitely, and that yes. made into a movie, into a film. Yes, I actually see this sometimes. When um, uh, it was, I think it was uh, the Schönbuck Forest, and I, I uh, imagined that I, mean, I got carried away on a daydream that Spielberg was making it into a film. <laughs> I think it made a very good film, and I had some music accompanying it in my head, and uh, the music was from Anton Bruckner. Oh, Bruckner, yeah. That's a good choice. I think it would have gone very well with the story, yeah. And any thoughts about putting a book into an audio book format? Because nowadays this is so popular. Um, not yet. I have started thinking about it, yeah. Because my son Anton, he reads reluctantly, but he does like audio books. So, so do I. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I thought about it, but whether I'm going to do it or not, I'm not sure. Well, we could try another session of the book club, <laughs> perhaps in another time, with some um, readings of your books. I I'm sorry, say again? We could plan another book club session with reading aloud of some of your books. I would be delighted. Yeah. I would be very For happy that, to do yeah. that. We would I very much very encourage native speakers to join us. <laughs> I think most people here are, not everybody, but um, yeah, I would be very happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be quite interesting. I think so too, yeah. Yeah, lovely to hear you talking about your work. Thank you so much for your answers. Very nice. Thank you, John. <laughs> and we thank you very much for this time, Robert. It was wonderful talking to you. Well, I loved it. Uh, I very rarely get the chance to talk about your book. So it's, it's, it's fantastic for me. It's been a really great opportunity. Feels As great. I mentioned, for us readers, it's a unique opportunity to hear directly from the author. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, if we plan a next meeting for the reading aloud of some of your books or novels, we will get everybody to know us. Fantastic. I look forward to it. Okay, people remember, if you have other questions, to access Robert's blog, which is called Thoughts and Words. Yeah. And there you can get more answers, more information about his book.
Great. Okay. Thank you very much, much. Okay. Ivana. Nice Thanks to talk to you. Questions. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye.